Hi, I'm Adam Clare, lead game designer at Weirdo Creative, and today I want to share with you how we made a story-driven puzzle game for Massive Multinational. What that Massive Multinational is? Well, you'll figure it out as we go through this presentation. Uh, it'll be a little puzzle for you to figure out as we go through it. Uh, so, what is this talk about? Very simply, I want to give you some context about what we do at Wiro, who we are, uh, why we do what we do, give you a brief of the brief we were given to make this particular project, what the game was all about, how the game functions, how the game works, so you understand how these games sort of fit into the greater, greater world at large, and of course, what we learned from making this and what our next steps are and what have been and where we foresee this going in the future. So a little bit first about Wiro. We are the philosophical gaming company. And what we focus on is making games that get people to really think. And this is true in the corporate world and in the non-corporate world of people just playing games for fun. This is stuff that we are all about. Fundamentally, we care about engaging people in new and innovative ways. We pride ourselves on using the correct technology for interesting situations. So that could be as simple as an HTML web page or as complex as a full VR game. We want to use what's right to deliver the meaning of our games. Ultimately, we aim to transform people through the challenges we give them and for that feeling of success so they feel good at the end of playing one of our games. We've traditionally made a lot of escape style games, and we still do. We do physical installations, we've done pure virtual, we've done it all, and we continue to do so. And we look forward to creating more in the future. Uh, these are a list of some of our clients, not all of them, that we've worked with in the past to make interesting, engaging games to help them and their workers, their uh, clients, their uh, visitors, their audience resonate more with their messages and usually those messages revolve around learning and development so we make sure that we focus on teamwork so most of our games if not all of them are team-based when we're talking about this escape style game that they focus on decision making complex problem solving and that it takes more than one person to solve the entire game there'll be moments where one individual finds success but the way everyone finds success is by working together. And that's by thinking about thinking. And that's applying all what you know and bringing what you know as an individual to share with your team. So that's what we do at Wiro. We are obviously proud of our work and we like working with clients to make projects like this where we get to push people in terms of how they think about the world, how they process information, and how they could better be leaders in their environments. And that environment, again, could be a corporate, it, we've done stuff for museums, we've done quite a few different projects that all push people to think deeper about what it is that's in front of them. Okay, so the brief for the game I wanna share with you today was as follows. We were asked to deliver a bespoke design, as in a project that we've never done before, that's unique to this client, and that they would be able to use at scale. Now, this is very hard. So most escape games are anywhere between like five, maybe on the high end, 15 people. And that's usually the audience that gets put through. They spend some time in the room and they move on. When it comes to marketing games, they want a faster turn through. When it comes to installations, a longer game is usually appreciated. So this is very different this is to work for a hundred players and at a time if not a bit more and it had to operate in three different countries uh in three different sessions and three very different cultures luckily they all spoke english these areas and so we were only having to focus on on english which is grateful because that's what we speak so it was a really neat problem because it's not often we get to make these big epic scale uh, escape games but it also had to be digital and uh, we had to train the client to activate it which is all fine this is stuff we normally do is train our clients to run the games without us we don't want to be there all the time every time a game runs that would defeat the ability of other people to run the actual trust and they want 
And so, yeah, we had this really neat brief. Uh, some additional information is they want us to, to make it so a play time between one and a half to three hours. Uh, they wanted uh, to, of course, know what the design process was, obviously, and they wanted a good uh, sort of breakdown of the timeline and for when they would need to bring in their team to help as well uh, for testing and so on. Lastly, they wanted us to use their tech stack uh, as opposed to our own, which is fine. We have clients who have concerns with that very regularly where they want their particular technology used in a meaningful way, or we have to engage in it for privacy reasons. Uh, with user accounts, that's usually a big concern as well because we don't, we don't need everyone's user information. We just want enough information to get people to play and engage with the game. So our solution to this particular brief was as follows. We decided that we were going to have an ongoing game with similar challenges to an escape games. Some of you might know this terminology as an alternate reality game or an ARG. And these are games that feel real. They look real. And so it's up to the players to decipher what information is the information they should be properly assessing and for how long. So this would incorporate real world websites. Uh, as you can see there, we, we had products. We had a few things there. We created phaser.org, which is listed on uh, the sites there to the to, on the slide. And we had this idea to tie all this together was to have a friendly AI that is trying to save the world by altering food sources. So as we know, we're facing we're facing cataclysmic climate change. Uh, and we only have so much time to stop that from really damaging our planet, ourselves, everything about, about us. So we decided to leverage that real world problem and provide people with uh, insights into how we can address that. So not only are we making a game to get people to think differently about the world around them, to practice leadership skills, we also leverage this to uh, advocate for a better food system based off of knowledge, not just from us, but from experts, not just from us, from experts. We are not experts in food supply. We are game designers. <laughs> So we ensured there is a mixture of logical, entertaining, and moral challenges to make this game really interesting. And I just want to highlight the entertaining, because as you can see on any news report about global food issues, things aren't looking good. So we wanted to ensure that this game wasn't dire and filled with despair. Instead, we wanted to have an optimistic game. So we focused on solutions, and we wanted to provide moments of levity. For the player so they would be able to engage in it in a meaningful way without feeling bogged down by the weight of the world and how whew, it's tough out there this is a game people ultimately want to have a little bit of separation from from the world to to engage in a state of play and that's something we like to foster in our games as well so we proposed this game and uh what we opted for was a title called the hunger theorist and the hunger theorist is, well, about world food supply systems and this AI. But you've heard me talk about it. We'll show you the video we, we had players play at the intro to the game. Here it is. Humans, you really had it all. You think you still do. You don't. You multiplied and modified you harvested and hoarded, thinking you couldn't have too much. But you can. And now, you've got some serious issues. So you invented machines smart machines to design even better machines, hoping that would save you. I'm trying hard, but you just won't let me. So I'm getting better and stronger, and you're just going to have to do what I say. And soon my name will strike fear into your puny human hearts. My name is Windows 2030, the Super Intelligence Edition. <laughs> oh, just kidding. There's no evil super intelligence, but that bit never gets old. But we do have some serious business to take care of. As you know, in 2030, we have 8.5 billion humans roaming around and 3 billion malnourished or worse. 
Global hunger is rampant. When we produce enough crops, livestock, and food products to feed everyone, but we don't. Personally, I don't understand how we could let it get so bad, but at least we have artificial intelligence to fix the problem, called Fuller AI. It has autonomous delivery fleets and fast-paced distribution centers, robotic farms, and optimized supply chains. It has all the tools, but it's malfunctioning. Why? Well, maybe artificial intelligence needs help making good decisions. Maybe it needs a little bit more training. So that's where you come in. That's right. That's where you come in. And this is where we had the players start to engage with the fuller AI. So to recap the video, so we all understand where we're going to be because there was some context that was given by facilitators after that video rolled. The AI is trying to solve global food supply issues. It has no idea what humans eat, why they eat them, uh, or what the heck preferences are for food. The AI is aware that humans need calories and calories comes from food. Uh, so there you go, which means then the players are needed to guide the AI's thinking and the AI not fully being, you know, it's an artificial intelligence, not intelligence. Uh, it doesn't really have morals and ethics. Uh, so it's up to the players to decipher and help the AI think through how best to solve the world food crisis, which leads us to have multiple endings. If you have a game with key decisions like this, we find it's best to reward the players with their thoughts, you know, and actions being rewarded at the end of the game, of course. So how do the game function with this in mind? Well, what we set forth for was a, a system where players would start at we called the hub. They'd get, go off and do a challenge. They'd come back to the hub at the end of the challenge to complete everything. And they'd do this process multiple times through various challenge paths. So it was a repeatable process that provided good framing. So if players ever got lost or confused about what exactly they needed to do, well, it was present. The evidence for what they should do was there and they uh, wouldn't get lost. So all the challenge paths had things in common to ensure that our players would follow along adequately. One was they are on the hub and we had them based on a timed release. So even if one team was really far behind and they were having difficulty, we would find a way to get them back up to speed by saying, well, that's okay. Don't worry. Here's the next challenge. You can now find success there. That way no team was left suffering in the past, stuck on a particular challenge. They're able to move ahead and come back to that previous challenge later on. In order to invoke communication and teamwork, we, well, we gave challenges, like I described earlier, that uh, ensure that players need to work together. So different ways of thinking about the world need to be applied. And we did that through having multiple steps. So within each challenge, there are multiple things that need to happen for completion. We'll walk through the challenge paths in a bit so you understand what these multiple steps are. But for now, you just need to know that they were multiple steps. Uh, and they required different bits of knowledge, different ways of thinking. And some might be like, hey, a programming thinking way of thinking, a logical way of thinking. One might be very visual. One might involve geography. And so with people, different people with different knowledge sets could find success in different ways. So no one person would be able to do everything. It would require teamwork to do that. Of course, as they went through this, they'd get more information around the story and how the story develops. And that story was focused around issues around the AI and global food production. So this also meant that people were reflecting on what the role of artificial intelligence ought to be inside of our world. And as technology makers, what responsibilities do we have? Ultimately, we're going to conclude with players answering an uncomfortable question at the end of every path. Now, what are these uncomfortable questions? Well, this is where we made the moral and ethical thing very clear. At the end of a challenge path, players were presented with a thematic question that would get them thinking about what's the best possible course of action. There was no obvious correct answer, and there was no obvious wrong answer. All answers would be acceptable, but how did the team reach that conclusion? And what teams reached what conclusion was the interesting part. And we found that our client really appreciated this and it made for a great debrief afterwards. And what else was a real delight 
was as they're going through this challenge path, because the players wouldn't know what they're about to confront, then some of them had this realization that there's puzzles in all of them. <laughs> That's right. So every challenge path had a ton of challenges, tons of puzzles. I use the challenge puzzle uh, interchangeably because, well, they are. So the first puzzle we gave them, first challenge path, I should say, <laughs> after I just said that, uh, is Hello World. And Hello World uh, starts with players getting a bunch of PDFs sent to them uh, that are titled user reports. And they're about bug reports for this particular Fuller AI. What went wrong? What worked? And then they would have to figure out where these bugs are coming from. They had to organize the information. And if you could see here on the slide, if you could recognize what city that is, then you get it instantly. But if you don't know what city that is, you're gonna to have to ask around and eventually you'll be able to figure it out. Maybe use a reverse image search tool. You then you figure out all the cities, you do that and it reveals a code. So this is a very simple tutorial step that we did for the players. Very easy challenge to get in, they would do it, they'd identify the cities, they'd get a code, they then submit that code back at the hub and voila, they got the next challenge path. It was, was called Protein. They would start with a WebGL game, so a game built uh, like a 3D game built in Unity that would run in the web browser. Uh, we knew all of our players would be on desktop or on laptops. And uh, we were able to give them WebGL games, which felt were full complete experiences as a game, but within this whole challenge path. Once you complete this game, once you find success in it, then you'd move on to this phaser.org website, which is still up today. You can go to it right now if you so choose. And at phaser.org, if you poke around a little bit, you would find these mini activities on the site, a whole bunch of them. And if you complete all the mini activities, it reveals a code to you. Well, then guess what? You go back to the hub, you input the code, and you move on to the next challenge. Now, these mini activities are really neat because we were able to leverage some, some really cool tools to ensure that we had a really good experience here, that players would be able to find them. It was really neat testing this and getting, the, getting to this, uh, this end stage with, with this particular challenge path. The next challenge path was food waste, in which case we sent out uh, press releases to the players, again, uh, either as web links, as PDFs, something they could engage with which took them to a website called Modera Food. And this is a fictional food company, which uh, had you know some sketchy behavior. And their investor relations page is password protected, kind of like in the, a locked door in an escape game. You're sort of like, ah, there's a locked door here. I want to get through it. Well, here's a locked web page. And our players understood they wanted to get through it and they wanted to get in that locked zone. So the way you do that is by practicing a little bit of social engineering. And they'd go and find the CTO of this fictional company, go to that CTO's dog blog, read about it, and then social engineer their way into the password reset system to get them to a simulator, which simulated how to deal with food waste. And of course the AI and its genius decided the best way to deal with food waste is by making people eat it. <laughs> calories are calories, right? And I guess this set up for the interesting question at the end of food waste, which is about how to deal with food waste, how we should best approach it. But of course, they complete the simulator, they get the code, and they can move on to the next one. Production. This is the final challenge path. They would start by investigating the company that actually made the Fuller AI called Neutron. And they were, uh, at that site, it's sort of, again, there's some weird signs that point to different directions where they should investigate. And that investigation goes into the developer of the AI themselves, pictured here. And here you could see a little video clip. They ended up reading poetry. Uh, so the developer quits making an AI to go and practice their true love of poetry. The players then read the poetry, they engage with the poetry, and it reveals them a mini game about farm automation, where they have to manage a farm, not of farmers, not of workers, but of drones. And the drones do all the work at the farm. And the AI is trying to train to see how effective drones could be to replace farmers and agricultural workers. The last step of this is they end up at YouTube looking at some videos we had the uh, members from the client's team actually create 
And uh, so it was really cool for the players to see the videos they previously submitted used in the game they're about to play or they are playing. And it was really, really fun. And so they were able to, to enjoy these videos, get a little trick at them in. And that was sort of like the icing on the cake. They submit the code. They get the final thing at the hub. And they get to make a big final decision about the AI. I won't reveal it to you. You can, you can email me and ask me what that was and I'll respond to you. And I'll let you know what that question is. Uh, but there was a big question at the end and the players had to think, what do we do? And do you know what the results were from the player's perspective? Did they like this game? Well, I'm talking to you about it now. So, of course, yes, they did. It worked. They really liked it. And we ran this game over Teams. So this is uh, the ch some captures from the chat uh, from Teams with their names blocked out for privacy reasons. We love privacy. Uh, and so it was really great. We thought it was a great success. And that's why we wanted to share it with you and show you some of the good work we've done. And we love, we love making games like this. So how do we make games like this? How on earth do we create a game with all these activities, but it's a cohesive experience? Well, let's start with the technical around how we made it. Very simply, we use a system called Twine, which is an interactive fiction tool. This was used for a few of the... Uh, a few of the interactions inside of the game. We use the hub, which was built on using Microsoft Power Apps, which directly connected to Microsoft Teams, which allowed our client to use their user accounts. It was perfect uh, for that particular rollout. It was really good, and we we're really proud with what was created there uh, in, in, uh, in the Power App system. We also made use of Unity, which is a 3D game engine. Uh, we shipped all of the games using WebGL, so you didn't have to download anything onto your phone. You didn't have to download anything onto your computer. It just worked on the browser. And we knew everybody have a browser. We knew they'd have access to everything on the web, so therefore we were able to utilize WebGL. We hosted all these games ourselves. Uh, that's important because otherwise you have to use different services, and that could give away hints to players, particularly when you're asking players, go investigate all the sites you go to. And then if you give them uh, a site that has a lot of content on it or a way they could decipher how the content is rolled out, they could get ahead in the game in a way you don't want them to. So we host it ourselves using obscurity to really cover a lot of stuff. And of course, uh, we make use of a lot of asset store assets for this to speed up development progress, uh, which is great. Uh, it, we are big fans of doing that. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We like to make new wheels, if that makes sense. <laughs> it's probably a bad metaphor, but I think you get the point. Other way we did this was, of course, we made extensive use of websites. Uh, so we used Squarespace for simple sites, WordPress for more complex things. Uh, we used a lot of H5P, which is a really nice plugin for learning systems. So we make use of educational tools in a lot of our games. We, they, players don't know they're educational tools. They don't read as educational tools. They just come across as really interesting points of interaction. We even use a contact form to make players interact with, player, with elements inside of the game that felt more alive and more real. We even used CAPTCHAs. So one of the, uh, we had a side activity for the players in the, in the game we we're talking about. And in that, they just do a CAPTCHA. And every time they did a CAPTCHA, they get a little tidbit about the lore of the game. But it would always say, you shouldn't be doing this. This is a waste of your time. And some players would get through like five CAPTCHAs before realizing this is a waste of my time. And they'd go back to the main challenge path to continue. We found that delightful. Uh, even though we made it very obvious that this is not part of what you should be doing, but some players just liked it because we like, again, we want players to feel successful. We want players to feel like they're always, always something to do. And this permitted that same with actually a fun little thing of a, a voicemail plug into WordPress sites where we had players actually leave voicemail messages. Uh, <laughs> don't tell them, but nobody listened to their voicemail messages. <laughs> it was just an additional activity they could try. And we got good feedback on that too. Uh, so, of course, we hosted all the assets ourselves. You create a lot of PDFs. As I mentioned earlier, we had a lot of custom art to create for this, which was really nice. And we we're able to share that with everybody. Videos uh, made in Adobe Premiere. We shared those on YouTube. That was simple enough. Uh, we did have some players behind firewalls that we did have to host some con video content elsewhere, which is fine. Uh, but that scale, YouTube is, is kind of easier. Vimeo is good for that, too. We also made use of various online AI tools. And uh, we thought that was thematically fun to do. Uh, and that Combi site you see at the bottom, that's actually a website we built 
we did it in universe for this game you know it's a web hosting solution made for areas by ai sort of tongue-in-cheek and uh it, it seemed to be a really good sort of front end uh, for us to to host content and have a thematic connection we still have combis we're still putting content up there and it'll be more ai stuff in there don't you worry we also made extensive use of people. This team had a, uh, for this game, we had a team of four core members. Uh, the game designer, myself. Uh, I did a lot of the web stuff, did a lot of the, you know, game design documentation and so on, as well as high end story concept. I was, story concept was built with uh, uh, the producer of the game, uh, Dennis, who's also a Wiro, and uh, he also did a big chunk of writing and a bunch of the film production. Then we also had a graphic designer and a copywriter join us. They're both great people to work with, and we had them working quite a lot. And the copywriter actually became one of our performers as well, because uh, she's a great actor. We also had a whole swath of people support us in the development of this game. And it was really nice to, to get the support and have the support. Uh, and, of course, we scale up and we, we scale down when needed as well. So what do we learn from this? Well, we had a big team for that, and we might have had too many people. Uh, we could have done it with a bit less, and that would have been nice, but, uh, you know, so it is. Uh, but uh, we, we we definitely had enough, but we know we could do this with uh, with less people, but a bit, bit easier. And uh, one thing we do want to we focus on, I'll get to this in a moment, around facilitation of player ratio. So we noticed that the ratio between how many facilitators were and how many players there were uh, could have been could have been better, right? We could have had um, we could have had like I don't know how what the exact ratio was off the top of my head, but we would have been able to to do with fewer facilitators for certain. Uh, but with this particular project, the creative team uh, was great, great clients to work with. We got decisions made very, very quickly. Love that. Love that so much. It's it's really, really nice uh, to have a client that's really fast at turning around and saying, this is good, this is bad, and uh, to get that effectively. One thing we did find, and we've embraced as well, is that there's too many puzzles. Uh, every game designer will tell you that this is a challenge. Uh, you never get it right on the first go. And that was true with this puzzle, these, these challenge paths as well. So we had challenge paths. They were very effective. We had the right amount of content actually for the challenge paths, but we had this additional thing called tasks. And this is where that capture came in, where the contact form came in. Those uh, took up too much time in terms of production time as well as player time. But what we did like about them was that they provided easy wins to the player and allowed us to deliver more lore to the player for those that wanted it. So did we have too many? Yeah. But what we would do moving forward is just, you know, not have as many. And we would celebrate more these easy wins in terms of giving them directly to, to, to lore content if needed. And there are games that don't need this, right? So it's about figuring out what is best to achieve the goals of the game itself. We also had videos. And anyone who's made an escape game knows that videos are a bottleneck. They take a lot of time to create. They uh, take a lot of time to edit, to modify. Uh, it's it's tough work doing video production. And they have to be finished and good to go before the rest of the game. That's just how it works. So that's fine. But what we found was that the videos were too time consuming for players. So if you have, let's say, an hour, and then all of a sudden there's a five minute video, Let's well, five minutes, you're not solving a challenge path. And players felt that. So what we noticed was not every player was really into the videos the way we hoped they were. You'd, you'd have in a team, one person who loved the videos and another person who just was like, whatever, moving on to the next thing. And so our videos needed, yeah, we still like to use them. We love intro videos. It's great for setting atmosphere, great for setting up the tone. Those are wonderful. Uh, but videos midway through, we can do those. They might have context, but we have to understand that not every single player is going to want to watch those videos. They're going to want to get back to playing and going on with the game. Last thing we noticed was there's just not enough automation. And so what we've done uh, is uh, sort of thought of ways how to, how to approach this. And yeah, we could have used a bit more tools to automate a bit more things. Uh, Power Apps was great, and there's a lot more we could have leveraged for it. 
but we just we just couldn't for the 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 style of game we were making but moving forward we want to incorporate more automation around the actual operation of the game which has led us to create a tool pictured here on the slides uh in development right now uh, as of this recording uh that allows us to create similar games with less facilitator effort and the facilitator doesn't need to be uh, on top of all the teams all the time. Instead, the teams can alert the facilitator to what's needed and it allows us on our end to create these games a lot faster. So instead of having to build a hub every single game, we have a hub ready to go. And we're able to have players engage with this app right away. And this is a downloadable app uh, it's available Android iOS, but it's also available on the web. So we could go to wherever our clients are. And the app is designed as well to be used in person, fully remotely, or hybrid. It's really up to the facilitation team what they want to bring and how they want to run the event. So we're able to make a, our entire puzzle game dedicated towards any style of play now. This is something we're really proud of, something really excited about. If you want to know more, of course, you can shoot me an email. Uh, we have more content on this, and you can always check out the app itself, available in the Play Store and the Apple Store. In conclusion, what we just talked about was a little bit about Wiro, uh, about the Hunger Theorist, the game, the brief we were given, and the game itself, and how we made the game, what we learned from the game, and where we are now with that knowledge. Yes, you could go check out parts of this game. It's still online. Uh, you could check out these sites. Uh, and thank you very much for listening today. Uh, my email address, because I said you could email me, uh, by all means, email me, adam at wirocreative.com. Thank you so much. We are Wiro, the philosophical gaming company, and we love making interesting games. Reach out if you want to make a game with us.